Great, thank you everyone for sticking through to our last presenting company of the day, which is privately held Viasite from San Diego. Viasite is developing pancreatic beta cell precursors called PEC, P-E-C, to treat type 1 diabetes. And today, the standard of care is islet cell transplantation, but the procedure has unacceptable failure rates and requires lifelong immunosuppression. So here to discuss the Viasite story is Mark Zimmerman, President Vice President of uh, Strategy and Business Development. Mark, thanks for joining us. So, Mark, maybe you can start us out by describing your lead product, which is called VCO1 or PEC and CAP, and you can kind of give us a sense of what, what exactly that is. Sure. So, this is on, right? Okay. Um, well, thanks a lot, first, for the opportunity to present today to Arm and, and Ted. It's good to see you. I've got a couple of slides. Um, our lead product, to your point, is called Peck and Cap. And its lead, this slide was shown just previously, a very similar slide with, with respect to your points around islet transplantation. Uh, and the bottom line is there is a predicate procedure, and that's the good news, I think, for the space. Uh, the challenge, though, is a scale, we need a scalable source of cells. We need a, uh, uh, a product that has a, re a reasonable cost of goods, and then also, like you mentioned, immunosuppression. So this slide highlights um, essentially the product that we're developing. We start with an embryonic stem cell line called CYT49. Uh, it has all the advantages of any pluripotent cell, which means it's uh, un unlimited scalability. The middle graphic speaks to the differentiation process and, and a stepwise differentiation process, where every two or three days we add reagents to the media to convert an ES cell down a pancreatic lineage. We develop um, pancreatic precursor cells, that's PEC01, and those cells are fated to become, they're about 80% of the way towards an insulin producing cell. They're fated to become endocrine. We do get all the endocrine cells uh, in that uh, final differentiation. So the, the, both products we're developing, we start, we have the same exact cell, okay? The difference is the device. And the device that's shown here is, um, uh, many call it kind of a high-tech tea bag. We, we take uh, polymer laminates, we fuse them together, and there's a, a lumen in the, the center of that. And the only difference, and it's the same exact materials, the only difference is that the one on the bottom is PEC and CAP, and it shows indirect vascularization. The vessels grow on the surface. And the, the graphic on the top shows that we've engineered ports into that device, and we get direct vascularization. And there's a specific number of ports and a specific size as far as those ports. So that's really the difference between the two, two products. Perfect. Now, you have uh, conducted a phase one study of PEC and CAP. And um, I wanted to ask what the key learnings have been from this trial. And this is one slide before that, yep. but, but the bottom line, the device, we do put them in sub-Q, mm -hmm. and it's, the devices are actually shown there. And then it takes about, uh, about two, two months to three months, we get very significant amounts of insulin and C-peptide. But um, to your point, this is the result from our PEC and CAP study. So the PEC and CAP, uh, started, we opened the IND in August of 14. We did our first patient in October. Started with Bob Henry in San Diego, and the second group in 2015 was with James Shapiro from Edmonton. And what we've learned from this uh, project is we've, we've now done 19 patients. We're continuing to take devices out as we speak. Uh, and the two graphics on the uh, below, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the central graphic basically shows good cell growth. So what we've seen in our Sentinel, in all of our devices, when we put eight devices in each patient, the patients are heroes in this, by the way. Uh, we put these devices in, we see when we get good vascularization of the device, we see good cell survival is shown in the middle. And on the left-hand side, you see clusters of cells, which is very much like what you would see in the pancreas. Uh, so we get good cell differentiation. So we've seen cell, cell survival, cell differentiation. And most importantly, or as importantly, we, we don't see any issue with uh, immunity. So the device is protecting the cells from the autoimmune and the uh, allogeneic environment, which is, which is obviously critical. The challenge that we've observed, and it's shown on the lower right, um, that, well, actually, that graphic shows insulin. Um, and it, so we have seen uh, that differentiation to those insulin-producing cells very much like we've seen in the rodents. The challenge is it hasn't been consistent. We've seen differences from patient to patient. We've seen differences from device to device. And we've really looked hard to try to understand that. And the, the bottom line is we're, we're getting a foreign body giant cell response to that device. 
Uh, and we, we have made some progress. Uh, we did change so you some learnings out of this. We've learned about the surgical procedure, how big to make the incision, how big to make the pocket, pharmaceutical intervention before and after, how to bandage the patient. I mean, first couple of patients, one was a rock climber and one was a surfer. I mean, so, I mean, things happen with patients that don't happen with rodents in a cage. So, you know, there's been a lot of clinical learnings and we've seen improvements, but we still don't see the consistency we'd, we'd like. So what we did, um, and this really speaks to it, we partnered with Gore. We just announced a couple weeks ago a partnership with WL Gore. One of the components in the device, the, device, the perm selective membrane, is Teflon, EPTFE. And uh, Gore has, has spent 60 years, uh, they are the leaders in the space. Uh, they, half of their business is in medical devices. Uh, they lead in vascular grafts. So they've done 40 years worth of work with respect to trying to understand the surfaces, how to manipulate those surfaces, whether it's structure, chemistry, whatever the case may be. Uh, we actually started this back in J&J &J when I was there, and um, it was really not a formal relationship, but we brought that through as we did a deal with Viasite, and we just announced a, a more formal relationship with Gore a couple weeks ago. Great. So I think what, what you're telling me, too, is that with the PEC and CAP, at least at this point, um, you'll be really focusing more on the PEC Direct program. So maybe we can kind of pick that back up and talk about sort of how that moves towards the clinic. So what was happening while the clinical trial was ongoing, uh, the Viasite team had been engineering this device with the ports. And when they saw the results, especially in a very specific animal model, and there are significant differences from animal model to animal model, uh, we found um, one animal model where we had a fibrous tissue response, a very robust response, but by putting the pores in, we've got that direct vascularization. So we, uh, and it, to me, coming from a big company, to see a company with foundational clinical learnings, do preclinical work, do the GLP study, go to the FDA, and right now, we're in discussions right now, could potentially start the trial within the next couple months. That's all happened in the last year. So a very strong pivot to PEC Direct. It's targeted for 10% um, of the type ones are, they're called either brittle or hypo unaware, they have severe hypo events. So we're targeting, this does need immune suppression. So in this case, it would be like an Edmonton type product, but you know, it, we think it's a, a large unmet need. So really an improvement over the islet cell transplant. Maybe you can take us back to that slide that goes through that um, market opportunity and, and tell us just a little bit more about that. Um, where was the, I don't know, was that one of the first slides? Yeah, I think it was earlier. Uh, Let's see if we go back a little more. Okay. Two more. There it is. Okay. Um, yeah, so that 10% of, uh, so when type 1s, and they're often diagnosed as children, so it's not unusual for people to have diabetes for decades. After about 10 to 15 years, people start to either suffer from hypo-unawareness or they have severe hypo-events, which means they need some, some help. Uh, and, uh, and or they have severe glycemic liability. And, you know, that was addressed. You know, it didn't come up for whatever reason, but there's a picture here. If you look at that one graph in the middle, you can see those gyrations. So the, um, that's really what we're targeting. And, you know, we've done market analysis now, about 10%, about 125,000 patients. It would be an orphan indication. Uh, we think uh, could be eligible for this type of product. The other advantages we see is our cells are less immunogenic than islet transplants. We're not bringing passenger cells along. We're not bringing endothelial cells from the vessels or nerves. We have a much purer population. So we think we may actually be able to dial down that immune suppression. That makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, you mentioned that you'd been at Betalogic, um, and which was part of, of Janssen or J Johnson Johnson. So uh, maybe you can tell us about why it made sense to put Betalogic and Viacite together and um, what the benefits are with a combined company going forward. So there's been a lot of talk about timelines here. I've actually been in this space 15 years. J&J uh, &J actually invested in this space to develop a scale, to, could we scale islets? That's how we started. Then we went to adult cells. And then we made the decision to invest in Novacell, which was a, a precursor to Viacite. Um, and uh, in any event, uh, we were track, we, we tried to do a deal a couple of times. We didn't. We were tracking along and competing with Viacite. Uh, and what happened, though, is when they entered the clinic in 2014, it was very clear where they were from a timeline perspective. So we uh, had a hard, lot of come-to-Jesus meetings over a year or so, and we decided in 15 it was time to really talk to, to them seriously about a deal. So what we did is we closed on our internal efforts. 
We transferred the technology, all of our intellectual property, which was significant, into Viasite, and five, of, five employees, including myself, are seconded to Viasite for two years. So uh, we're, we've had one year so far, uh, and so we've been you know, kind of, uh, we're employed by the large company, but we're living the biotech experience. There you go. So you guys have strong partnerships with both CIRM and JDRF. I think you're probably right. One of the better funded from from both of those large mm -hmm. organizations. So, what have these um, partners brought to Viasight beyond just capital? Well, credibility. I think that's one of the biggest things. Certainly, the JDRF is you know the leading uh, foundation out there that's working towards a cure or supporting cures for diabetes, and they've been a, tre a tremendous organization for us. Uh, CIRM, uh, the funding has been absolutely critical. They've certainly facilitated relationships with others, you know, uh, as far as collaborations. So, you know, they've just been both, I think, really good partners for us uh, over the course of really the last 10 years. Great. And the last question that I have, we've been talking about the regulatory change, 21st Century Cures Act. How have your interactions with the FDA gone, both around PEC and CAP, but now also with a pivot towards PEC Direct? You know, I would echo, I think you've heard a consistent message that the agency has been very uh, engaging and supportive and appreciates that these are, this is a new space. Uh, we are developing a full, you know, uh, combination product. It's a biologic and a class three device. So, you know, there's, there's some new learnings for everybody here. Uh, we've had a great experience uh, with PEC Direct. We're looking at potentially an orphan indication, breakthrough designation, maybe RMAT designation. Um, those are all things we're gonna look at as, from a timeline perspective, just to, uh, I want to show you that at the end because I think that's one of the key takeaways here. You know, we're poised right now to enter the clinic. Like I said, in the next month or so, this highlights we could, uh, our plan is to do three patients in a, in a safety trial with PEC Direct and start a second cohort of 36 patients. Uh, it could start as early as October. Uh, and, and the goal is we want to see insulin in patients next year. Great. Awesome. Well, that's very ambitious, um, especially to be turning so, so dramatically for the company. But uh, we'll keep a close eye and see how that progresses. So thanks so much for being with us today, Mark. And thank you, everybody, for being with us for the fifth um, annual Cell and Gene Therapy Day um, here in Boston. I hope it's been worthwhile for everyone. And thank you very much for attending. Thanks a lot.